Good morning. Good to see you on this beautiful morning. If this is your first time with us, welcome. If you're joining us online, welcome. For those who consider this your church home, we are so grateful that you are here. It's truly a gift that we get to be together to celebrate our creator, redeemer, sustainer. For those I haven't met, my name is Tom Abbott. I'm blessed to be one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church. I have the great honor of sharing that pastoral role with Hillary Downs, who's just back from camp. And we'll be leading worship this morning with Hannah, who's Hannah Bingham, who's preaching this morning, and Liz, who's leading musically this morning. I'm so grateful that we get to be together uh, as we are worshiping God this morning. A few things about our life together tonight. There is worship at 5 p.m. if you want to check it out. Tomorrow night at 7, the weekly Bible study meets by Zoom. Uh, Check your email for a link. Hannah Bigham's small group is on Tuesday nights at 7 at her house. If you need information about that group, please ask. Uh, Thursday morning at 7, men's breakfast meets at Romeo's. We also want to express our gratitude for everyone's generosity with our congregation. If you'd like to make a financial gift to the church, you can leave your gift in the basket at the back. Summer's often a time when giving slumps a bit, so if you're able to share with the congregation during this time, that's a huge blessing to our joint ministry. If you'd like to know more about sharing your time and talents with the congregation, just talk to Hillary or myself and we can help you with that process. Um, asked Hillary if she'd be up for sharing a little bit about camp this morning, and she said she would be, so. <laughs> She's alive, so that's uh-huh. Yeah, I just, I just want to say thank you for all of your prayers for us and over us as we were at camp last week. Um, there were three of us adult leaders from Salida. It's our Pueblo Presbytery camp, so there were, I think, 78 campers there. Uh, 35 kids from Salida and four high school students who were interns and serving as kind of assistant cabin leaders there and then three of us who were adult cabin leaders. Um, and it was just this beautiful week of, um, of worship. We, we have worship time in the morning and worship time in the evening and um, just seeing kids just enjoy that and and pray and sing and and get into that is a beautiful thing. Uh, It's a time of building new friendships as they get to know other kids in their cabins and other kids who are just there at the camp and um, as they run around together and 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 make new friends and get to know other adults as well and uh, our theme for the week was salt and light so we talked about what does it mean to be when Jesus says we're to be the salt of the world and the light of the world what does that look like for us? And so we wrestled with that in all different kinds of ways. And some kids did it by what they ate at lunch. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, I was saying I had one kid who ate uh, goldfish crackers and olives every day for lunch. Um, but anyway, um, it was just a beautiful week of seeing them grow in relationships with each other and, and grow in their understanding of God's love for them. So thanks for your support. Thanks for going, Hillary. (laughs) Now as we begin our worship, let us take a moment to breathe, to focus, to make space for the astounding truth of God's love. Would you please join your hearts with mine in prayer? Lord God, who brings us mornings and beginnings Touch our heart to hear your call today. Grant us faith to rely on your extraordinary power in us that the life of Jesus may be made visible as we glorify you alone. Amen. Now let us join together in opening our hearts to the voice of the Holy Spirit as we read um, from Acts 20, verses 17 through 24. Listen to and for God's word to us. From Miletus, he sent a message to Ephesus, asking the elders of the church to meet him. When they came to him, he said to them, 
you yourselves know how I lived among you the entire time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears, enduring the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. I did not shrink from doing anything helpful, proclaiming the message to you and teaching you publicly and from house to house, as I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus. And now as a captive to the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me. But I do not count my life of any value to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you're able, let's stand and sing our first hymn, Come Sing, O Church in Joy. continue to enter into God's presence again would you join your hearts with mine in prayer gracious God have mercy on us for we have failed to be faithful to you though you have been faithful to us you show us your wisdom but we prefer to go our own way our broken relationships with you and one another have created poverty in us and our neighbors. In your mercy, reconcile us to you and one another for the work of justice, peace, and love. God of days, we praise your name for your grace sustains us. We wait for you, Lord, for your word strengthens us. Our outer nature is wasting away day by day, but our inner nature is being renewed by your daily bread. Grant us the eyes to see what cannot be seen and to gaze on what is eternal. May we revel in your work and be a visible witness of your invisible kingdom. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. We can stay seated as we sing our next song.
Our second scripture reading comes from James chapter 1. I, James, am a slave of God and the master Jesus, writing to the twelve tribes scattered to kingdom come. Hello. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. It's good to see you all. James is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It always has been. It's very straightforward, and James has a no-nonsense way of teaching that resonates with my personality. <laughs> and it may not be your cup of tea, and that's okay. Um, one of the gifts we have in the biblical narrative is a lot of different writers with a lot of different personalities and styles of writing. And James happens to speak to me. Um, and I hope that as we spend the next few months in the book of James, because we're going to be uh, talking about James, working through James until September, um, that something in here will speak to you, even if it's just kind of the practical life and faith advice that James offers. And because we'll be in this book until September, we really have the opportunity to slow down and to cultivate our curiosity about this piece of scripture. So today I'll be giving a bit of context and background on the book of James as a whole, 
And then we'll dive into the first four verses of this book together. James is a letter addressed to communities made up of followers of Jesus, scattered throughout the Roman Empire. It's not entirely clear when it was written or by whom it was written. There are several potential Jameses mentioned in the Gospels that this letter has historically been ascribed to, but it's most commonly attributed to James, the brother of Jesus, who is mentioned a couple times in the Gospels, and according to the book of Acts, James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem after Jesus' resurrection. But regardless of who wrote the book of James, it was likely written within the first 50 or 60 years after Jesus' resurrection, while the church and the movement around Jesus were still quite new. James leans heavily on the literary traditions of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, and the wisdom literature. James is a letter of practical wisdom and instruction in some ways similar to a wisdom book like Proverbs. It's a book about living with maturity, faith, and justice, recalling the long tradition of Hebrew scriptural law. It's also a consistent call to action, reminiscent of the prophets and their call to God's people to be doers of faith, emulating God's character in everything particularly in allying with and caring for the oppressed and marginalized of society. In the Old Testament, this prophetic call was usually to care for the poor, the sick, the widowed, and the orphaned, those who were most vulnerable and marginalized in society at the time. James echoes this call. Even the name James, which is Jacobus in Greek or Jacob, recalls the long history and traditions of the Jewish people. James is greeting to the 12 tribes at the beginning of this letter when he says, I, Jacob, immediately roots the teaching that follows in the scriptural traditions that would have been so familiar to the readers and the listeners receiving this letter. As I was preparing this sermon and reading commentaries, I was particularly struck by the work of the commentator Martha L. Moore Keish and the various emphases that she pulls out of the book of James. I think they're super helpful, and so I'm going to throw four of them up on the screen. Galen, if you wouldn't mind putting those up there. <clears throat> I found these four particularly useful. And I'm going to briefly talk through them so we can keep these larger emphases in the back of our minds as we dive into the first four verses of James. So first, James is likely addressing a group made up largely of Jewish immigrants, refugees, or first-generation citizens, people pushed from their homeland due to the power of the Roman Empire, rather than the privileged Roman citizens with lands, rights, and assets readily available to them. As a result, many of these people would be situated more at the margins of Roman society. James then emphasizes rooting our identities in God and in God's word and finding shared identity and community there rather than finding identity elsewhere, like in wealth or in power or in a particular national identity. Second, James offers practical advice for living in community with others, particularly regarding how we use our voices and our words, how we love one another, and how we use our money and our privilege. This can be helpful for us in thinking about how we live in community together as a church, but also as we engage with the hateful speech between the ever-diverging political groups in our nation and in the world particularly as issues of economic disparity are so often central to the nastiness of our nation's public discourse. And James spends a fair amount of time talking about money and economic disparity. Third, James is continually concerned with the poor and the sick and all those who are situated at the margins of society. He calls attention to people and to a society that neglects and isolates those without power. 
James offers a prophetic critique of those in power alongside hope for those who are oppressed. And fourth, in a time of anxiety and change, James offers an emphasis on the enduring word of God and our own call to respond with endurance. James reminds us repeatedly that God is consistent and consistently generous, loving, and just. We are called to this same consistency in faith and in action. When we are prone to anxiety, to fear, to anger, and to reactionary behavior, James calls us to take the long view and to keep being active doers of our faiths, emulating God and God's character in all that we do. James repeatedly reminds his readers and listeners that faith apart from faithful action is dead. As we continue to read James, I challenge all of us each week to not just read the small sections of verses that will be explored on Sunday morning in the sermon, but to reread the whole book of James each week. Don't worry, it's short. It's only five chapters long. In my message version of the Bible, it's only five pages long. <laughs> it should take like maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes to read each week. But when we keep in mind that larger context of the book and who James is writing to, the themes he's emphasizing in this letter, it can better inform our weekly readings of these smaller sections of verses um, so that we don't actually accidentally take these verses out of the larger context of what James is writing. Um, so let's read these four verses together again. Um, I, James, am a slave of God and the Master Jesus, writing to the twelve tribes scattered to kingdom come. Hello. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. So let's move through this verse by verse. James immediately starts out his letter by greeting these communities of faith with joy, naming himself a slave of God. It's tough for us to hear this word slave without immediately thinking of our nation's history of chattel slavery or even modern day human trafficking and other horrific practices of slavery. Here, James is again recalling the Old Testament and a common Hebrew scriptural tradition, referring to himself as a servant or as a slave of God, perhaps more helpfully translated for us in our context as a mouthpiece of God, or an instrument of God, or a helper of God. And before we dive in further and move beyond James's greeting to the 12 tribes, I want to briefly address what I think James is not saying in these first four verses. I know for me it's easy to read this passage and fall into a long and often harmful theological tradition of assuming that James is saying God sends or causes tests and challenges in our lives so that we can be refined in our faiths. This is a common theological interpretation of scripture because it's neat and tidy. It's a quick answer to the problem of pain and suffering or to why bad things happen to good people. The reality of challenges or of suffering in our lives is often far more complicated than that. And throughout the biblical narrative as a whole, the picture we get of God's character is of a God who is with us in our suffering. A God who lovingly created us to be in right relationship with one another and with God's triune self, and who is with us, suffering alongside us when that vision of wholeness does not come to fruition in our world or in our relationships because too often brokenness, violence, and sin take the center stage. In Jesus, we get a picture of a God who chooses suffering and death for our sake, not a God who sends suffering and death to us on purpose. 
The kind of theology that paints God as a God who sends suffering our way can be deeply harmful to us individually and to others who are in the midst of suffering, especially for those who have experienced genuinely traumatic things, such as abuse, rape, violence, being a witness to genocide, a victim of systemic oppression, and so on. To say that God meant for someone to be harmed in those ways in order to refine their faith is to paint a brutal picture of a God who purposefully causes harm to God's own beloved people. That is not really the picture of God that we have in scripture or in the person of Jesus. And regardless, it's certainly not the theology of challenges or of suffering that I see James using in these verses. So when James says to consider it a sheer gift, when tests and challenges come at us from all sides, to let it do its work in us so we might become mature and well-developed, what does he mean? Remember that for James, faith is always tied to action. He says that faith without action is dead. So when tests and challenges come at us from all sides, from a world broken by our sinful choices and run on systems of unjust power, faith under pressure in the face of tests and challenges is an action. Notice that James does not specify that tests and challenges are sent to us by God. No, James simply says when tests and challenges of all kinds come at you from all sides, consider it a sheer gift. Consider it a sheer gift because it is an ongoing opportunity for mature, faithful action. Action that emulates God's character. James continues on to say that we know that under pressure, our faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. In other words, faith under pressure reveals whether or not our faith truly informs our actions. It's easy to profess our faith and it's easy to say and do the right things when our life circumstances are easy. But what about when we are on the receiving end of hate speech? What about when someone yells at us? What about when we've been insulted, humiliated, or our character has been publicly dragged through the mud? What about when our great ideas are ignored simply because we're not in positions of power? What about when we're unjustly harmed by others? What about when these things happen to the people that we love most? I think often when we use the word endurance or when we think about faith under pressure as the message translates it, we can tend to think about being a kind of glorified doormat, sitting back passively and letting all manner of injustices and sufferings roll over us or over those around us while we endure. But faith under pressure, according to James, is active. As James describes later in the letter, faith under pressure is never passive. It is prayer. It is communal care. It is active resistance to systems of power and privilege that keep certain people in spaces of power and other people pushed to the margins. It's using our voices to resist, and it's keeping our tongues in check when we're tempted to simply add our hateful words to the hate already going on around us. Active faith is holding one another accountable, speaking up when we see injustice at work, praying for one another, laughing and grieving together, actively seeking to be people who bring God's love, justice, light, and hope into every space that we enter. Faith under pressure reveals whether we are active doers of our faiths or simply passive believers and observers. James tells us that this faith under pressure, this active endurance, leads to maturity. The message trans translation says, don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. As we continue to read James in the coming weeks, we'll see a growing picture of what he means by this word maturity. Maturity for James means becoming a mirror to God and God's character. 
when we are people of maturity, when we allow God's spirit to fill us and inform our actions, we become people of faith and action, people who act like our loving God as we go about our lives in the world. I want to give an example of where I see this kind of embodied faithful action in a communal setting within our own community here in Chafee County. In the last few decades, there has been an ongoing critique of our nation's criminal justice system and a movement away from punitive justice, so from justice that is more based in punishment, to restorative justice. One of the early leaders of this restorative justice movement in our nation in the 80s and 90s was Howard Zare, a Mennonite who used his Christian faith and practices of that faith to inform his advocacy for systemic justice and systemic change, particularly in practices of restorative justice. An iteration of this restorative justice movement exists here in Salida. There's an amazing organization here that you may have already heard of called Full Circle Restorative Justice. This organization seeks to offer an alternative to the traditional criminal justice process, especially in juvenile cases. It's a confidential and voluntary program in collaboration with the district attorney's office who sends them referrals. The restorative justice process allows space for the harmed party on one side and the responsible party on the other to be directly involved in finding a reparative and a restorative path forward together. The harmed party has the opportunity to share how they have been harmed and how their life has been impacted by the actions of the responsible party. And the responsible party has the chance to gain a deeper awareness of the negative impacts of their actions on the harmed party, taking real responsibility for their actions from a place of genuine remorse. And together, alongside trained individuals who facilitate these meetings, a path forward is charted for restorative justice. And the responsible party then goes on to fulfill all the agreed upon items in the process towards that restoration. And that path forward can look different depending on the situation in question. This restorative justice process is an amazing example of the kind of tests and challenges that can put our faith under pressure and that provide an opportunity to show the true maturity that James is talking about. Full Circle Restorative Justice here in Salida is not a specifically faith-based organization, though it is based on some Christian ideology because of the foundational work of people like Howard Zare. But it is an amazing example of action in the way James talks about faithful action, and a space that we can learn from as we seek to embody our particular Christian faith as people who believe in God's grace, forgiveness, and restoration of all people, but also a space where we can learn about collaboration with people of other religions or non-religious backgrounds as we seek justice and wholeness in our community and in the world. Obviously, this example of full circle restorative justice is an extreme example where crimes have been committed. However, when both the harmed person and the person responsible for that harm can really hear one another and chart a path forward into true restoration, that is an example of a maturity that reflects the character of God. Rather than adding to the hate already in the world or allowing the harm that was caused to fester, both parties are instead challenged to move forward in true maturity and restoration. For both victim and perpetrator, this is not an easy process. And obviously, in extreme examples, this is not something to try on our own at home without professional help in facilitating and moderating this process. But in the ordinary challenges of our lives, most of us could learn from this kind of restorative process. When we have arguments, when we're in the midst of Thanksgiving dinner and there's some hate rolling around about various political issues, <laughs> Learning to truly hear one another, 
to own our mistakes and apologize with genuine remorse, learning to forgive one another and learning to chart paths forward with true collaboration. This kind of maturity is really hard work. I know it's certainly something I struggle a lot with, but it's one example of the kind of faith in action that James so thoroughly emphasizes throughout this letter. So in our own lives, both individually and communally, when tests and challenges of all kinds come at us, let us be people who consider it a gift to be able to respond with God-oriented maturity, rather than people who add to the hate and the sin and the injustice in the world around us, or who passively sit back and let suffering or injustice rage around us let us be people who respond actively with love, with maturity, with justice, and with hope. Let's be people who live in emulation of the God who created us to be embodiers of our faiths, living out an active and mature response to God at work in our lives. Will you pray with me? God, thank you so much for this time together that we get to gather and worship you. Thank you for being a God who is a God of love and justice and of hope. Show us how to be like you, how to not just believe, but to act. Thank you for the hope that we have in you and in your son, Jesus. Amen.
invite you to join your hearts with mine and let us pray. Gracious God, life is complicated and messy and yet also oh so good. And we are grateful, Lord, that we get to live it. Trying to figure out who we are and who you are and how we are connected to you. Trying to figure out what we believe in a world that feels like it's throwing us so many messages from so many different directions is hard. But God, we are grateful for this time together to be with others who are on this journey seeking meaning and seeking after you. Holy Spirit, guide us as we go. Lord God, we are grateful for the beauty of summer, for the shift of seasons and all the refreshment that it brings. We thank you for our Pueblo Presbytery summer camp, for all those who put just hours and days and weeks into planning it. We thank you for all the good that happened there this past week as our kids both worshipped and played their hearts out. And we pray, Lord, that the seeds planted there would take root and grow in their lives. We pray that they would listen for you whispering to them, nudging them, so that they would be salt and light in this world. Lord, we also lift to you our high school Guatemala mission team that's preparing to leave on their adventure this coming Saturday. God, we pray that you would grant safety in travel and in all the things that they do, that there would be good health. We pray for a deepening of relationships with one another and with you, for a broader sense of your presence alive in this world and a deeper commitment to following after you. God, as we seek to be people who extend your hospitality in this world, we pray that you would be at work in each one of us, that we might be people of welcome in all kinds of ways and places, people of welcome even as the summer tourist season begins and some of us lament the loss of quiet. Lord, help us to figure out how we can love our neighbor and provide welcome. God, we pray for us as a church to be a place of welcome as well, that all who enter this place might know that they are loved by those they encounter here and loved as well by you, just as they are. God, as we think of our neighbors around the world, we pray especially today for those in Canada who are wrestling with wildfires there. We pray for safety for all for residents and firefighters. We pray for protection of property. We pray for healing to come to our earth and that the fires would go out. Lord, we pray for places of violence in our world, whether that is violence that happens in homes or in personal relationships, or whether that violence is between nations and people groups. God, we know that you are on the side of life and health and wholeness. Lord, we pray that wars would cease, that weapons of hatred and destruction would be laid down. We pray that your kingdom would come to earth. God, we pray for friends who are struggling with health issues, whether that is chronic pain or illness or cancer or recovery from an addiction. We pray especially today for Alice Ross, who continues to be in the hospital and pray that she would know your presence very near to her during this difficult time. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful gift of our bodies and we pray for healing to come to all who need your touch upon them. Bring wholeness, bring help, bring health, we pray. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who is our savior, our redeemer, and our friend the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I invite you to stand as you are able or as you wish as we sing together again. we go from this place, let us be people who are doers of our faiths, that our faith would inform our actions in all that we say and in all that we do. Please join me in our unison benediction. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has a purpose in you being there. Christ who indwells you, has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe it and go in God's grace and power. Peace be with you all this week, and thank you so much for being here this morning. Have a wonderful day.